So they're all filing in. Zerilla, did you caught make contact? I was not able to get a hold of him, so I, I left him a brief message. So. Okay, so well, we have everybody here. Maybe we'll just stop start. And the first thing on the agenda is to have a roll call. So. <laughs> yes, um, President Schwartz. I'm here. Vice President Nurse. Here. Trustee Goodman. I believe is here. Here. Yes, here. He is. Trustee Holliber will eventually be here. Uh, yes. Trustee Mandelkern? Here. And student trustee Chanette? Here. And also present tonight are Chancellor Clare, Chief Financial Officer Slater, Skyline College Interim President Jackson, College of Cemetery Acting President Lopez, Kenyatta College President Moore, and District Academic Senate President Wallace. And uh, Trustee Holliber, I just saw him for a minute. Where'd he go? Present. Present. He's here. There he is. Welcome. Okay, um, we have a flag, fellows. Oh, we do. Thank you. And here's our flag. So let's you'll join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the, flag the flag of the United, United States, States of, America of America and to, to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, stands one, nation, one nation under, under God, 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 indivisible. indivisible. With liberty, liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We're getting better. <laughs> well done. Okay, uh, there are no actions in closed session to announce. Uh, discussion of the order of the agenda. Trustees, are, is there any corrections to the order of the agenda? I must find you all so I know where you are. Hearing none. I will go down to statements from the public on non-agenda items. Um, I don't see any chats or hand raises. Sorella, do you know of anybody? No? no? I do not. I don't see anybody. I haven't received any correspondence either. Okay. Yeah, okay. So we will go to page two. <laughs> New business, 20-71A. Approval of personal items, change assignment, compensation, placement, leave, staff, allocations, and classification of academic and Move classified. Approval. Well, I have a, a motion and a second. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions for Human Resource Director David Fion? Fion? Spit it out. Um, I don't hear any. Are there any comments from the public? Any more discussion? So quiet, I'm gonna call for the vote. All in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. 20-72A, consideration and approval of Skyline President, President um, With, with great agreement. pleasure, Madam President, I move approval. Thank you, and we need a second? Second. And David Fune, I think there, uh, you were gonna add something to the oral summary. Correct. So I, I will go ahead and as we do when we take contracts to board, I'm going to provide a, so I'm providing an oral summary of the contract. So it's, um, this is a contract for Dr. Melissa Moreno as president of Skyline College. And uh, the, the contract includes a three-year term agreement through June 30th, 2023, effective August 1, 2020, an annual compensation of $260,052. Dr. Moreno will receive 225 hours of vacation annually and can cash out up to 10 days of vacation annually. She will receive one day per month of sick leave and the same health and welfare benefits, including post-retirement medical benefits, as are generally provided to management personnel. So that, that's the conclusion of the oral summary. Thank you, David June. You did a very good job. Uh, any comments from the public? And I think Chancellor Claire, you'd like yeah. to be recognized? Well, I, I certainly want to give room to make comments for the public to make comments, but I'd actually then like to introduce uh, Dr. Moreno formally, but I, I'll 
defer if there are any public comments. And Alexis, if you can bring uh, Dr. Marino in, that would be great. There she is. <laughs> there she is. Welcome, Dr. Marino. We have not voted on you yet, but... <laughs> oh, no, we don't have to. Yes, we do. You do. Um, we do. Other public comments, I, it, it is really... Um, <clears throat> pleasure to introduce the next president of Skyline College and, and I, I've been saying her last name wrong all along it's Marino not Moreno um, so that was corrected um, no that's okay David I said the same I saw you and we are just thrilled um, I want to um, first of all um, thank Dr. Um, Jackson President Jackson for stepping in this year we keep teasing her that the next time she gets a phone call from the 650 area code not to answer it because this has been quite a year to be an interim president um, so, Dr. Jackson, thank you so much for, for your contributions, and we're going to honor you properly at the next board meeting. And I know that you and Melissa have been already working together to prepare for the transition. Um, I also want to thank um, the, um, the, the screening committee at Skyline College. They forwarded five really top-notch candidates, and I know uh, uh, President Moore was the co-chair of that committee, along with um, Academic Senate President Kate Brown. You really did a wonderful job, and, and we're just pleased to have uh, Dr. Marino here. So, um, congratulations to Dr. Marino. I don't know if you want to say a few words, and then I know uh, the board will take a vote. I don't want to put you on the spot. No, sure, I'd love to. Thank you. Um, I, first of all, uh, want to thank the board and Chancellor Claire for such a thorough process, mm -hmm. and. Um, I knew that it was an honor to be chosen to serve Skyline College and the team there. And, but I had no idea really the level of talent and caliber. And I have a full uh, schedule this month meeting everyone. And um, I'm just so thoroughly impressed and uh, humbled by the talent and the team. Um, and then a, spe a special thanks to Dr. Jackson who has been so gracious and has spent so much time with me um, and uh, just very generous. And so I just wanted to thank her um, in particular. And um, I'm very, very excited to join the college and the district and I'm ready to serve our students in our community. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I think we should officially vote for you and then I will open up to the board to probably make a few comments. So we have a motion and a second to, uh, to welcome you to the district. I don't know the exact words here. The approval of the Skyline President Employment Agreement. Um, so I think we're ready to vote. All in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? And now if board members, would you like to make any kind of comments at this time? Uh, Trustee Metalkern, because I see you first. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Well, first, uh, welcome, Dr. Marino. Uh, it's great to have you on board as our new president of Skyline College, and I'm uh, uh, glad to see you're already hard at work meeting people and getting getting your feet on the ground up here in lovely San Bruno. And I hope you brought a sweater or a parka, depending on the day and how thick the fog is. But I also wanted to thank uh, Dr. Jeanette Jackson for stepping in and serving so ably as our interim president for the past year. And I know we'll, we'll more thoroughly celebrate you at our next meeting, but I just know you were a very impressive individual from your, your background when we first saw it on paper, uh, in terms of both being a, a chancellor over in the East Bay and being a, a distinguished veteran and officer and a high ranking officer in our military. Um, it was a quite, quite a, a interesting and, and varied and thorough and high powered background and you've lived up to the expectations. So thank you so much for everything you've done in a, extraordinarily challenging year. I don't think any of us saw what this year was going to be like when you when you came on board a little bit over a year ago. And then I also just want to join also in thanking the hiring committee at Skyline for doing a very thorough and diligent job and, and bringing this to a great conclusion with an outstanding candidate in uh, Dr. Marino. So, so thank you all and I'm looking forward to working with Dr. Marino. Thank you, Trustee Mendelkern. Uh, Vice President Norris. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Trustee Mendelkern for delivering my speech. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I appreciate it, and, and I, echo every, <laughs> I echo everything that uh, Trustee Mandelkern said about both of uh, these individuals. Dr. Jackson, thank you so much for your, your uh, service this year and being with us. It was a great pleasure having a, an opportunity to work with you, and again, we will 
we'll honor you next week. Uh, Dr. Marino, um, welcome to our district. I look forward to meeting you personally and to working with you. And I, I'm sure that uh, great things will be happening up at Skyline. Thank you. Trustee Holliver, did you like to say anything? Yeah, I, I sorry, I had to unmute, yes. Uh, so, um, similar comments, uh, uh, look forward to uh, uh, thanking uh, Dr. Jackson for a uh, great job that she's done over the past year, and uh, uh, very much looking forward to working with uh, Dr. Moreno. Um, and, um, you know, we, we, we take a lot of pride in our district, and certainly in Skyline College, it's a terrific institution. It does so much for so many thousands of uh, students. And, um, you know, we know that you will uh, keep uh, building it and, and making it, uh, you know, an even better institution. Uh, very impressed with, with your background, your, your range of um, experiences in government and community college and the private sector, dealing with uh, academic matters, dealing with uh, community ed. And, you know, I think I just can't wait to uh, See you get going. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll work uh, with you very closely. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Goodman, and I thought I saw a little person with you on your film. You had a, yeah. a guest. Yeah, I Is got that my a future niece. Skyline student there? Not yet. She's, in te she's from Texas. She's oh, just okay. My brother. Um, no, Dr. Marino, thank you uh, and congratulations. Uh, we do look forward to working with you, um, your skill set that you bring to Skyline will be um, definitely definitely um, valued, um, but also um, your experience that you'll be bringing to our district as a whole and our entire educational community. And I'd just like to welcome you on behalf of my board and the rest of the students and community from our community college district. Thank you, trustees. Oh, how about our student trustee, Jade? Oh, yeah. I just want to congratulate Dr. Moreno on her position and welcome to the district. Very good, thank you. Uh, Dr. Moreno, thank you very much for accepting the offer and coming to teach, uh, to work up at Skyline. Um, we'll find that you not only have wonderful colleagues in the district uh, to work with, but you'll have wonderful staff and faculty and students to work with up there. Dr. Jackson, thank you so much. We will have uh, more to say later to you, um, and you and I can compare needs as we go through the rest of our lives together. But. Uh, thank you very much, trustees, for your kind words. I, I really have enjoyed my time here, and I do believe working closely with Dr. Melissa Moreno this last, well, I guess it's only been a week or two, but it seems longer than that. Um, she's absorbing everything and, and, and I think is going to do uh, the district as well as Skyline Crowd. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. We will talk again soon and Dr. Marino will get to know each other a lot better as time goes on. So welcome to the district. And we have voted and so it is official. Uh, there is a question in the chat and I do believe that um, one of our, Dr. McVean is going to answer that. So we'll take care of that right now. So I think we're ready to move into the study session if everybody's ready. The discussion on addressing- oh, Excuse me, President Schwartz. So I, I do see there's like six or seven questions uh, from members of the public. I know they, they've kind of missed the public comment period and I don't want to disrupt yeah. our agenda, but is it going to be possible to address those or at least let them know that I know as a board member, I'm going to be commenting on this issue during our board member comments at the end of the study session. Yeah, maybe you didn't understand what I just said. I said Dr. McVean uh, was going to go ahead and answer those ans in the chat. Oh, in um, the chat, not in, it, not in the yeah, meeting. Yeah, one on one. So if, if that's, I think that's appropriate. Unless the chancellor wants to say anything further, we thought that might be the appropriate thing to do. But it's at your pleasure. I think uh, Dr. McVean is closest to the situation along with Dr. Luan. Um, so it's at the pleasure of the board. We can answer it now if you want, or we can answer it through the chat or wait for board comments and, and it's your, your, your pleasure. Yeah, I, I personally think it's a personal thing one-on-one -on -one that if Dr. McVean would take the time to do that. Uh, and then if we want to get to board member comments, we can also make some comments later if that's agreeable. Fine. Okay. So we're ready to go to our study session. 
a discussion on addressing the obligation gap. Chancellor Mike Clare, you are going to introduce this report. Well, well, thank you so much, President Schwartz. And um, I, I'm just so pleased that uh, we have the opportunity to have an in-depth discussion about an extraordinarily important topic, uh, a talk that we continue to talk about, a topic that we need to continue not only to talk about, but to take action on. And, um, and so I, I, I have the personal pleasure of working with most of the individuals that will be presenting tonight. And uh, their, their, their knowledge combined with their passion um, to help our most underserved, underrepresented students, it, it's, it's just part of who they are and part of their DNA. And when you combine that with their extraordinarily, extraordinary knowledge in this, in this subject, um, it's no wonder that they got together to write a book called Minding the Obligation Gap. As you know, this is also a group that is putting on a webinar series, or I, I guess it's a, I'm not quite sure what you call it, um, that a number of people have enrolled in. And um, we can certainly make the Zoom um, uh, uh, link available to anybody that wants to view it. It's, uh, we have a lot to learn from this group, as, as well as many others. Um, and as I understand it, the, uh, the book, uh, uh, was released. It was Amazon's number one um, uh, number one release in terms of new education um, uh, books. So congratulations! And it, with that, it's my pleasure to. Um, I think I'll, I think I turn it over to Dr. Sims, and I, I know you'll probably introduce the rest of the team. And we we look forward to the uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Chancellor Chancellor Claire um, to Duncan. And so I want to clarify, somebody reached out to me and asked about our uh, qualifying the book as number one. So it was the number one new release on Amazon in educational psychology, educational philosophy, social aspects, and educational policy reform, insofar as Kindle is concerned, because it's been hard for whatever reason to come by the paperback. So as far, insofar as Kindle is concerned, it was the number one new release in Kindle and all those designations that I spoke to. Um, and so I wanted to, uh, uh, I think we have some slides. Jeremy, are you able to share the slides? Here we go. So I want to talk first about kind of the impetus of the book, and then I'll turn it over to, actually, I'll turn it over to Tabitha now. So I'll just stick with the slides. That's the easiest way to go. Jump in, Tabitha. Dr. Conaway. Um, thank you all um, for inviting us. Um, my, my goal is to really set the stage and bring in the larger social and political context and really frame the obligation gap and the discussions that we want to have today. So thank you for inviting us. Um, we're, we're in the midst of a pandemic and this pandemic has disproportionately killed black Americans, not because black peoples are innately predisposed to contracting COVID-19, in reality, it's this same anti-Black racism that has allowed systemic oppression to become normalized in our society. And it's responsible for making Black people far more likely to die from COVID-19 and police brutality than any other ethno-racial group. All of this demonstrates either an apathy or a total disregard for Black life in this country. Um, all of this oppression continues to allow violent and heinous crimes against black bodies with impunity, right? Without justice. And so when we are talking about um, protests, the protests that are still happening, right? By the way, um, although we are, the protests are focusing on a, a small number of people who have suffered um, just recently, right? With, um, because of a racialized system, um, but this racialized system is systemic and it's proven that the lynching of black bodies is acceptable, right? Um, I know oftentimes this word lynching is not a word we hear often, but it defines the permitted killing of black bodies without trial, right? And typically without punishment. And so I, I bring this into the conversation because as educators, we can't allow ourselves to be silent to be uninformed or to be willfully 
um, ignorant or ignore the reality our students face, right? Um, we often now in our um, perpetual Zoom rooms, we talk about um, the new normal. But I want us to take the time to reflect and revisit the old normal, right? The old normal of systemic racism um, that our students have been living through. Um, oftentimes when we have discussions and we globally, right? Um, when we have discussions about race and racism, we, we talk about racism as a single racist act, right? Um, and that's, that's easy for many of us to talk about, right? It's easy to talk about racist acts done by racist people. Those are easy to identify for us. But what is happening, what is happening um, that is currently being amplified um, with the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, these are not just simple acts of racism, right? Um, yes, they are acts of racism, and yes, they are very violent and horrific, but that, that is not all that is happening, right? It is not a single act of racism. Instead, it is racist systems and policies and procedures um, that have gone without being critically analyzed, that have gone under the guise of neutral practices and neutral policies. And so I, I bring this into the conversation to connect it to our educational systems, right? When we look at the field of education, we need to critically reflect on our own practices, right? What are our practices and policies that continue to disproportionately impact, right? To harm our students. And where can we begin to create changes within our district, within our institutions, within our spheres of influence? And so I, I just wanna take the time to say there's really a nexus between racism and neutral policies. When we, when we think about neutrality, we, can't, we cannot be Switzerland. Although on a side note, I enjoy chocolate. So I'm willing to accept that after this, but we, we, cannot be, we can't be neutral, right? It's not, neutrality in this sense is not a safe haven, right? When, when we talk about neutral practices or colorblind practices, they're not colorblind at all but they're privileging white culture explicitly. And they're negating the culture, the identity, and oftentimes the humanity of our students. Many of us here have been educated within um, an American educational system. And this system of education reifies white middle-class norms, right? And values um, which are evident in Western hegemon hegemonic structure. So when we talk about state sanctioned schooling within the United States and the legacies of assimilationism that presently encourages students to abandon their home languages, to abandon their literacies, to um, abandon their culture in order to mimic the cultural norms of a space, this is not humanizing a system for our students. This is not helping our students, right? Um, and within this, this framework, white middle-class values are really used as the litmus test for success. And humanity and value become strictly associated with accepting the uninterrogated and normative assumptions and beliefs prevalent within our public school system. And so now is the time more than ever that we need concrete actions and change and um, some of the leaders in this field, like Dr. Karras and Dr. Luke Woods, ask us, how do we better prepare our colleges to teach Black minds with dignity, right? So I, am, I implore us to think about that tonight. So how do, how do we do that? How do we bring humanity into our spaces? And really, when we talk about the impetus for not only the book, but the impetus for, I think, all of our work, 
we talk about our obligation to call these things out. We talk about our obligation um, to look at our policies and be explicit with how we frame our policies to identify what our goals are, to identify what we are trying to do, who we are trying to support and to call that out. Um, because we have to have the willingness um, to interrogate our practices and not just the willingness, really kind of this excitedness to want to interrogate our practices to do better. And so I, I just want to kind of wrap around my conversation that when we are intentional, we can, we can make change for positive. So we need to move away from phrases like um, neutral phrasing that says we're going to increase this for all students. Because oftentimes when we try to create programs and practices and policies that highlight all students, we really conjure up white faces. And success for that group, often at the cost of our minoritized students. So despite our best intentions, despite um, our desire to help our students who are historically marginalized, um, if we don't call these groups out, if we don't call out our practices, if we don't take time to be reflective, um, then we are perpetuating this system. And I know that's not our goal. So we need to begin asking ourselves, how do we disrupt this established institutional um, system and practices and policies that oftentimes we ignore because we think we can be neutral? What practices do we have to center um, in order to make these changes? And so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that just sets the stage for our conversation into brave leadership. So thank you. Thank you. Jeremiah, do you want to go first and talk about the impetus from your point? Yeah, it's always, it's always interesting trying to find the Zoom, I mean, the uh, unmute button. No um, So yeah, so the impetus for the book, um, much of it was covered by what Tabitha discussed. Um, I was had, had, I was fresh off the heels of writing a book around critical reality pedagogy, a, a, an educational paradigm that I'd worked through working with African-American middle school males. And so the process was arduous, but it wasn't as arduous as I thought it would be. So I had a crazy idea to work on another book. And in that book, I wanted to talk about what I uh, defined as the pedagogy gap, because I feel like and I was more of a regular earlier on the board meetings and I was always bringing this conversation to the fore um, with regard to K-12 education. So, so in K-12 education, even if you want to work with four and five-year-olds, you have to take some coursework on teaching and learning. And for the most part, that's not the case in community college education, nor is it the case in four-year uh, uh, education. And so I felt like one of the reasons that there was a kind of cognitive and even cultural dissonance between the students that we serve and the faculty that serve them to the best of their abilities is that they hadn't had or they weren't required conversations on teaching and learning that had that had taken that had taken place and so you know i know that some esl programs some other programs do require that but for the most part if you know if you know statistics and you have a master's degree in statistics you just teach statistics because you're hired as a content level expert but there are two kind of different ways to envision that right so there's content level expertise which undoubtedly we have to have but then there's pedagogical content level expertise right so that's an understanding of how to teach and so i wanted to take that up the pedagogy gap um and i talked to jennifer about it who was my supervisor at the time she said she'd been thinking about the obligation gap and what that means and I, and and she really opened my eyes when she brought that to the floor i reached out to jeremy and Lasana and Tabitha, because we had worked together in some capacity and everybody had something going on. And so from there, we were able to put together this book. And this book is not just a resource insofar as literature is concerned, but this book is really a tool. At the end of every chapter, uh, there are discussion questions and each questions can function as a kind of professional development opportunity. And so we built this to be a tool that folks can use in order to work towards educational equity for all of the students that we serve. 
And so with that, I'll pass it back to Dr. Taylor Mendoza. Thank you so much, Jeremiah, for that. And thank you, Tabitha, for your words and for framing the, um, the discussion for tonight. I'm always just amazed of just your growth and your talent. And, I, and I'm gonna call you Dr. Conaway right now. <laughs> so thank you. Um, so everyone, good evening, uh, Board of Trustees, Presidents, Chancellors, and all the educational leaders on the call tonight. Um, I am super excited. Um, about this discussion and also just really, really excited about the work together to, to define and determine our path and, and being an anti-racist district and even the level of comfort and, and people are, are feeling now and even saying anti-racist and racist, that's, ex that's exciting. Um, I appreciate Chancellor Claire for initiating this conversation and, and suggesting that we share our book and, and the work. Um, so why, so why for me the obligation gap, money the obligation gap? Uh, for me, really, uh, I realized some years ago that our shared obligation to really, to really serve students. And so for me personally, it became a personal call, a call to action. Uh, so the impetus uh, behind the book was simply an opportunity to, to crystallize my ideas around our obligation to serve students, in particular, you know, obviously students of color. And, and with that, you know, really begin to, as Tabitha, Tabitha so eloquently said, you know, transform policies and rethink our position in relation to the student and, inter, and the institution and how the student um, engages with the institution. So the obligation puts the onus on educational leaders to make the change and not rely heavily upon students and students feeling this burden that they need to come so prepared to do this or do that, but the institution getting prepared for them. So that's really, really in simple terms, the why it was important for me to, to really research and write this book and, and to begin to share. So um, the conversation tonight for me, so the, the chapter that I wrote is chapter two. And I focus on three main practical tenets underpinning the concept of the obligation gap. Um, if some of you have read already, the three tenets are genuine care, uh, civic consciousness, and brave leadership. Um, I am briefly going to review with you tonight uh, brave leadership and some of the concepts around that. So next slide, please. And should I just, okay, we'll come back to this. That's okay, yeah, we can come back to that. Cool. Thank you. So, you know, when I was thinking of the, the practical, the tenants, it was really important for me to begin to kind of operationalize them, um, having a research background and, and really making sure these, these, these terms, these definitions can be, um, you know, researched, they can be assessed and measured, right? And so some of the concepts behind buried leadership, and the first thing is to really name dispar disparities and share accountability. So what do I mean by that? So we have to be uncomfortable. We have to be comfortable enough to communicate directly. And we have to sometimes be uncomfortable to be direct and, and, and really beginning to hold people accountable and hold ourselves accountable in our policies. And this is very difficult. And each culture is very different as well in how you go about doing this. We had a great conversation on our call today obligation gap of how do you call people in, you know, and one person has said, oh, calling in is really sort of, um, you know, is, is that, um, are we sort of relenting ourselves to sort of white fragility if we call people in, shouldn't we just really be calling folks out? And so there's a way to have genuine care around it, but I think it's important for us to begin to really name disparities and share accountability. One of the things that we've talked about is looking at positions of color, right? People in positions. And we see that there is, um, on some campuses, they're more diverse, right, uh, than others and within our district. And why is that? Why are some campuses more diverse when it comes to the faculty? Or why is it more diverse when it comes to administration or when it comes to classified professionals? So really being able to identify the disparities and, and really share accountability and also identify obviously the disparities in students and seeing where students are falling short. Another thing that's really important is promoting an equity agenda and administrator, staff, and faculty hiring and evaluation. 
you know, as brave leaders, we need to review and improve our processes. Jeremy Wallace on a call today did a great job about the triple helix. And I hope you talk maybe just a little bit about it today because it was powerful. I'm still trying to process it all because we have got to do a better job in hiring, evaluating, and I'm forgetting the third one, hiring, evaluating, and curriculum. Curriculum, thank you. And he just went through just how we sort of repeat ourselves and how do you begin to break this cycle? Um, and he talks really just beautifully about just the whiteness of it all and just a Eurocentric framework. So I think we need to really be honest in our equity agenda and, and sort of really see um, where we're falling short. Uh, another thing is implementing a mission and purpose design uh, to inspire change in others, right? So vision is so essential and we need to codify this in our official documents. And so we're going to talk a little bit about our planning documents, our mission statement, whether they say, you know, our, 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 our board goals, you know, our planning documents, our educational master plans and, and, and vision. I, I began to look at vision in a new way. Um, I was reading an article and they talked about vision as vivid images, right? Being able to see something, being able to really visualize how a, a way a world can be or a situation or even, um, you know, an environment. So I think it's important for us to all have vision and not just leave it up to the chancellor or the board of trustees or presidents or vice presidents, but how do we all have a shared vision together? And then really what the really important piece of brave leadership is really understanding the psychological cost of of silence. And this for me was really important in my own introspection and work. I feel, um, I'm, I, you know, first of all, we're, we're not always, we're always growing, right? We're always learning. You, you just don't wake up and have it all, you know? So I think that's really important. And I'm, I'm finding that I'm, I'm really, really um, seeing things different and clearly in a way that I did not see before. And so I think that's really important to just admit to and to acknowledge. And so as we get into this space together, we're uncomfortable with that growth and understanding that we may not know it all. And so, and understanding the cost of silence, you know, we need to understand the negative impact it has on the internal external community, right? We, we can't, we need to be proactive. And so what does brave leadership generally work against? It, uh, next slide, Jeremy. Uh, brave leadership works against organizational inertia. Um, and, and for some, I don't know if anyone's a cyclist. I think, Mike, you are. It's like cycling in a, a, a headwind. And I've heard you use that before, right? Organizational inertia. You know, we are not even talking about racist ideas or, um, you know, racist practices. We're simply referring to the difficulty in any organization or culture to make change. It is hard when you have you know, you want to make change and it's a status quo and we rely on antiquated practices and policies to move us forward. And so I think we have to really understand organizational inertia as a barrier um, to implementing strategic and high impact organ organizational change because it doesn't allow for new perspectives, right? It just, only thing it does is just continue the status quo. And when we ask ourselves why that is, and it's really that tension between the innovation and the change and the realization to wanting to be safe and comfortable and just really um, not disrupt the cycle. And so you'll hear that a lot in this book, or you'll hear us say that, how do, you, how do we become disruptive technologies, right? How do we begin uh, to do this work? Um, and so we'll, hopefully we can have some discussion about that because disrupting the cycle is really important. And when I was in my PhD program, the first course, one of the first courses I took was breaking the cycle of failure. It was amazing. And that's when I became aware of Nogueta and um, folks like Kozo, who really talked about the injustice in K through 12 systems, and particularly in low income areas. And they talked about how to break the cycle of failure. And that has just stuck with me for some time, for some, for so long. And I think we also need to think about that here. So uh, you know, one thing I want to say is that I, I know I, I remember in 2015, and I'm going to speak to the Board of Trustees, you updated our board goals and strategic plan to a student first agenda, and you enacted a social justice framework. I was so excited about that when I saw it, because that works against organizational inertia, right? So we're doing this work, but now we're taking it a step further to get to an anti-racist uh, institution. And then in addition, I know that now uh, Trustee Goodman and Trustee Mandekern and Chancellor Clare, they're participants in a year-long 
um, fellowship, the trustee fellowship with the chancellor's office in Aspen. And, and that's another great example of how you got you guys being involved in trying to make a, a transformational change. So I know we all want the same thing, but how do we, how do we go about doing this? So next slide. So we can't talk about theories of change and important concepts, um, you know, without really coming to a common understanding and definition, right, which is really transformational to change. And so I want to read an excerpt from uh, Ibram Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist book. Uh, Kendi says that definitions anchor us in principle. So I'll say that again, definitions anchor us in principle. This is not a light point. If we don't do the basic work of defining the kind of people we want to be in language that is stable and consistent, we can't work towards stable, consistent goals. Some of my most consequential steps towards being an anti-racist have been moments when I arrived at basic definitions. And I really think that is where the work starts. And it's part of genuine care. You know, it's part of genuine care to establish a baseline of common um, understanding. To become, to embark on becoming an anti-racist district, we need to consciously articulate how we define terms that can help lead us to policies, procedures, and practices uh, for our most deserving students, right? And so lastly, you know, really in, in doing this work, we provide opportunity for institutional reflection and change. And, and we see these dualities all the time, right? And, and how to be an anti-racist, he talks about duality. What does it mean to be racist? What does it mean to be anti-racist? What is inequity? What is equity, exclusion, inclusion? And it's important that we begin to really have a, have a common understanding and a foundation um, to really begin to talk about racism. One of the other things I want to talk about and what we don't often do enough is having the opportunity to have institutional reflection and dialogue. We go throughout our day, we're so busy, but we don't really get the chance to talk to one another, to process concepts, and we need to find a way. There's been so much discussion about the college hour or, you know, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, but how do you set time aside to really begin to help people come to terms and, 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 and really reflect? And usually this reflection and dialogue can be then seen in our board, board goals, policy, mission statements, values, and other really relevant college uh, planning documents. And so that's a little bit about brave leadership. Um, thank you for your time. I look forward to the discussion in which we can talk a little bit about how we can use these concepts to move uh, the district forward. Thank you. All right. Should I go back to uh, Jeremiah's presuppositions real quick? Yeah, probably. All right, I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Can you guys hear? All right, perfect. So the guiding presuppositions for this conversation, I, I feel like it's always important to outline or delineate presuppositions so that there's no confusion about what's coming out, right? So if, you, if there's some ambiguity between what we intend to say and what you think we said, then you can defer to the presuppositions because they should offer points of clarification. So the first presupposition is this. The San Mateo Community College District Board wants to prioritize real transformative anti-racist work. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to leave that there for a second for you all to process, because if you want to do that, there's some steps. Some very definitive intentional steps that need to take place in order to create an environment that is not only not racist, but it is but is actively and intentionally anti-racist. The current stated mission of the San Mateo Community College District Board does not reflect the requisite principles of an anti-racist educational approach. And so soon um, after Jeremy uh, enlightens us, I wanna to talk to you all about a tool that I think that uh, the tool was birthed from Minding the Obligation Gap, but it's not included in Minding the Obligation Gap because it came after. And so I wanna share the tool with you, with you all after this. And so this, this second presupposition will make more sense. And then thirdly, the San Mateo Community College District leadership at all levels needs to audit, review, reimagine, and reimagine policies, practices, and pedagogies in order to push towards an educational atmosphere that is anti-racist. So this has everything to do with the, the state chancellor's office call to action, right? Where we were mandated uh, in many respects 
to audit, to analyze, and to critically kind of uh, dive into our policies, practices, and pedagogies to ensure that they're commiserate with not only social justice, but a clear, um, intentional, anti-racist educational paradigm. So those are the three presuppositions for everything that comes from this presentation. Thank you. All right, I think that brings it to me. So let's get to work. Um, I wanna start uh, my section of this presentation with um, what m many of us white folks thinks, think is a new um, movement in our country. It's really not, it's a, probably decades old, um, but it's just getting a lot of press right now, right? And that's the uh, disbanding the police movement, all right? And basically kind of the briefly, the, um, this movement comes out of um, the, um, the law enforcement's kind of nationwide inability to um, protect and, and instead commit violence against communities of color in particular. Um, the police brutality, as we all know, is, uh, is not new, right? I think, uh, I forget who says it, but it's just being caught on camera now. Um, and I, I want to kind of like rewind a few years, um, back to when the, um, the, the Ferguson protests were happening. Um, after Michael Brown was murdered, um, there were a lot of calls to reform police departments, right? Um, and out of that, out of those protests came um, like mandates where police officers had to wear body cameras or um, there were procedures that, uh, that like they couldn't use chokeholds anymore. They um, had to handcuff the, the, uh, the person that they're arresting a certain way, et cetera, right? Um, but I think it's like really important for us to understand that, that none of that's worked. You know, Ferguson happened several years ago, right? And it's the same old story, right? The body cameras didn't work, right? And, and the social media is not working. I mean, we've seen in the last month how many times a police officer who knows that he or she is being filmed either by a news crew or by activists with cell phones still continue to abuse protesters and use unacceptable force against them. All right. Uh, one, one such example, all right, happened in Buffalo several weeks ago. Um, this picture of it there is on the bottom of the screen for you, where an elderly protester was aggressively pushed to the ground. He ended up being hospitalized for weeks. I think they actually had to put him into a coma for a while. Um, yeah, recently in Nassau County, right, and we, there's several videos just like this, but three protesters were arrested violently uh, for simply speaking out against police brutality, right? They were chanting, right? And the police officers had their feelings hurt. I'm not sure what, but again, knowing that they were being recorded, they still continued to use excessive force, all right? And the reason why is because all of these, um, all of these uh, uh, procedures, policies, the body cameras, all that aren't treating the deeper issue. Right, they're tack-ons, they're add-ons, right? There's a, there's a deeper issue here, all right? Um, this conversation is obviously not about the police, all right? So I'm gonna go ahead and move on because there is a parallel I wanna draw to our institutions, all right? Um, our institutions, like law enforcement, has some deeper issues that cannot be remedied by simply adding an equity question to hiring committees, by creating an equity committee, by adding the word equity to our strategic plan, right? There's deeper issues that we need to start identifying, right? Um, our institution, I mean, I think it's an important historic, it's an important historical point to know that our institutions, including the three in our district, were never built for students of color, right? And it is in our DNA, it is in the very core of our institutions to marginalize students of color when they do come to our campuses, All right? So we need to make sure that when we talk about justice and equity, it is at the core, it's the very foundation of 
our institutions, right? Earlier today when I was doing my webinar, um, you know, I kind of, I kind of, I wanted, I made the comparison to a house, right? Um, if you have a broken foundation in your house, like you don't go and put new windows up, right? You don't go and put new drapes up. You don't put, throw a new roof on. You don't carpet your house, right? Those, those are all really effective at like at, at hiding the broken foundation, right? Which is a lot of times what some of our equity, our equity work does, it hides the cracks, all right? But we need to fundamentally de deconstruct that foundation and build a stronger one that's based on social justice. Um, and so I wanna piggyback a little bit on what um, Dr. Conaway, Dr. Taylor Mendoza have been talking about when it comes to language, all right? Falling, falling terms are, are pretty common in our colleges and our entire system in higher education in general, right? We, we hear the words, the terms, achievement gap, opportunity gap, often obligation gap, which is a fairly new one on the scene, um, and equity gap. I wanna just take a moment to, to kind of discuss these terms a little bit. Um, achievement, achievement gap, right, is, is when, when, when educators use that term, right? They're, they're likely putting the, um, the blame or the impetus for racialized outcomes on the students themselves, right? Because if we think about it, who achieves in our campuses, right? It's our students, they're the ones achieving, right? Um, so when we say achievement gap, we are arguing that the difference in outcomes between our African-American, Latinx, and Pacific Islander students and our white and Asian students are caused by a lack of achievement, right? Um, in the former groups, right? Which implies that these gaps are caused by some kind of deficiency in our students of color, all right? Um, and, you know, to be honest, like that, that term is, you know, it's deficit minded. It's, uh, it's wrong headed. And if we really think about it in this context, it's racist, right? There's nothing wrong with our students of color, right? So we just got, we just got to throw the achievement gap term right out the window, right? It doesn't belong in this district. All right. The next one that I'd like to talk about is opportunity gap. This one, this one is a bit more progressive. Um, it was actually co coined by Prudence Carter and uh, Kevin Weldner in uh, their book, Closing the Opportunity Gap. And the progressive part about this term is that it shifts the onus of our outcomes, our racialized outcomes from the students to the institutions, right? They argue that outcome disparities are a result of limited opportunity for our students of color and other marginalized students, all right? And that, is li that limited opportunity is caused by our institutions. All right, um, problem with this kind of discourse though, is that it, it, it doesn't go far enough, right? When we, we, see the, we see these outcomes, right? We see these outcome disparities. And so we create programs and we create services and we hire people like retention specialists, right? We, put, we throw all this money at it, try to build up the structure and then we kind of just wash our hands and move on to the next thing, right? And we feel really proud of ourselves because we're, we're very equity minded. Um, Problem is that these services don't work if the students don't know where they are, right? If we hide them in the basement of our college and the students can't get there, we just threw a bunch of money at something that isn't serving our students, right? Furthermore, if our students don't know about those services, then how can they use them, okay? So I think that's where the obligation cap, gap comes in, all right? Or the language around the obligation gap, right? It's not enough to simply build services and build programs and hire retention specialists and other support staff. We need to make sure that we are directing students to those services, right? Um, we need to have a campus culture. We need to change our campus culture so that we're intentionally and deliberately connecting our students to the programs and services that they need, all right? And it's recognizing that us as leaders are obligated to act and do everything in our power to enact equity and achieve justice, okay? And then this final one, equity gap, I hear all the time, right? I honestly have no idea what it means. All right, I'm assuming that means some kind of gap between equity, but when equity is like, when, when, you have, when you have a group who is kind of your baseline, right? They, there's no equity there. They're, they're just the ones that, were, that the system was made for, right? So I, I would even say that um, even the equity gap language is something we should get away from. In fact, I do have a theory about this, right? Well, I agree with the theory from another scholar. Right. His name is Donaldo Macedo. He wrote the introduction to the pedagogy of the oppressed by uh, Paulo Freire. 
Um, he wrote that academics tend to quote, accept the dominant standard discourse and aggressively object to any discourse that both fractures the dominant language and bears the veiled reality in order to name it. Thus, a discourse that names it becomes, in their view, imprecise and unclear. The wholesale euphemism such as disadvantaged, disenfranchised, educational mortality, theater of operation, collateral damage, and ethnic cleansing remain unchallenged since they are part of a dominant social construction of images that are treated as unproblematic and clear. And I would also add comfortable, right? It is way more comfortable for folks to say equity gap, right? That, that doesn't like put like any kind of burn in the pit of your stomach, right? Because it's not calling out what the reality of what's going on in our institutions, right? Opportunity gaps the same way, right? We feel really good about opportunity, right? But it doesn't really call out what's really going on in our institutions, right? And if I could just, you know, and I, you know, I don't want to, um, to uh, offend anybody. It's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to keep things real a little bit. You know, this board, we have, we have something on our regular board agenda is called the Contemporary Conversations in Race, Class, and Gender, right? And I, I want us to think about and critique how we, how we handle those conversations, right? Because if we think about it, if we look at them, right? We, what we do during this, this agenda item is that we have all the campuses talk about what they're doing to celebrate our student, our, our, our marginalized students, right? So for example, last month we had the Pride Month, um, the Pride Month um, uh, contemporary conversation, right? And this is how it went. We had each school discuss what kind of events they had to celebrate Pride Month. And then after that, we had each board member and some in some of our executive leadership talk about how much they support our LGBTQIA students, right? And how we're doing such a good job with our programming and our celebrations of Pride Month, right? We know at no point did we ever stop to ask ourselves, what are we doing to oppress and marginalize our LGBTQIA students, right? If I go back to February with Black History Month, right? Again, it was like, let's have all three colleges talk about how they celebrated Black History Month. And then every, all the board members and all these executive like, leaders are going to talk about how much we support our Black students, right? And then we're going to move on, right? But we don't stop and say, like, and ask ourselves, how are our institutions actually perpetuating anti-Blackness, right? No offense, but this is peak privilege, right? We, we're, we're, ta we're sanitizing what's going on in our institutions and then patting ourselves on the back because we're programming, you know, we have this cultural programming going on in institutions. And so um, my challenge then is for you all is to like, let's actually talk about the reality, right? Let's actually talk about what our students are, are feeling when they get to our campuses, okay? Um, uh, the last thing, I, th I think this is my last slide and then I think I'm gonna turn, turn it back. Yes, it is, okay. The uh, last thing is I just, you know, I kind of say like, what, what can the board do, right? Because um, that's why you're here, right? You want, you want to hear what the board can do to close the obligation gap, all right? Um, and so I have a, a couple ideas here. Um, so the first one is create a vision or position statement that guides your work as a board, all right? I would suggest putting this vision or position statement on every board agenda, so it sets the tone for every meeting. Um, I suggest having some real critical dialogue all right, during the contemporary conversations portion of the agenda, let's, why don't we call it critical conversations about race, class, and gender, right? And actually have some critical conversations about it. Um, we don't want to over rely on race neutral or colorblind solutions, all right? And we don't want to blame the socioeconomic factors off campus, right? Because I do hear, and, and, I, and like, this is good, like I'm glad we're having these conversations about hunger and housing insecurity and all that. But we also have to realize that we have plenty of middle class and wealthy students of color on campus who are experiencing racism in our classrooms, right? This is not solely a socioeconomic issue, right? There's an intersection here between, and, I've, and Jeremiah will speak to this a lot better than I can, right? Between capitalism and racism, right? Um, uh, and then the other thing is that, you know, support the constituents as they start to reconceptualize our colleges, as they start to rebuild that foundation. All right. Some of these things might be uncomfortable for y'all, right? And I've, I've know traditionally that the board has been very much against things like murals, right? Or, or, or putting names on buildings, right? To, to making our uh, campuses more cultural, right? That might be something that comes up. And so 
you know, like I'm asking you to support our students, our faculty, our staff, and our administration when these kind of proposals come up, right? Um, Dr. Taylor Mendoza referred uh, to the triple helix I discussed earlier, right? And I'll briefly let you know what that is, all right? Because again, this is something where I think the faculty, staff, and administration are going to need support from the board, right? But the triple helix um, it was actually first coined by um, the critical race scholars uh, Richard, Richard Delgado and Jean Stefanschik. And they were referring to how um, case law all right, is uh, re reproduced through the Library of Congress um, uh, legal heading system. All right? And it's really, it's really complicated, but essentially you have these three databases that use the Library of Congress um, headings and basically they perpetuate this, the, a certain type of case law and exclude any type of case law or legal theory that challenges that. Right? In our community colleges, we have a similar type thing going on. We have a triple helix that's comprised of curriculum, hiring, and evaluation, right? And let me just kind of give you a brief overview of how this triple helix works, right? Um, as I mentioned before, our institutions were never meant or never built for students of color, probably not for faculty of color either, right? And so what happens, we have decades and decades of hiring practices um, that were created by of a majority white professoriate, right? And so you, ha you, have, you have the majority of the faculty, full-time faculty who are white, they um, create a curriculum, right? They create the official curriculum of the college, right? And we enshrine this in our course outlines and in our AA requirements, our program requirements, our SLOs, our PLOs, our ILOs, all right? So we have this very um, Eurocentric um, curriculum that highlights and centers whiteness. And then, when we put together a hiring committee, right, these same white folks that made the curriculum are the majority, if not the entire hiring committee, right? And what happens is then they go and hire another white professor, right? And now we have a brand new tenure track professor who's going through tenure review. He's being, he or she's being evaluated uh, by his or her white peers, right? And they're being evaluated with how well they utilize and stick to and conform to the curriculum that this body made before, right? And so it just becomes this huge circle that continues to reproduce itself, all right? So this, require, this is gonna require the faculty, the staff, and the administration to come together and start to um, think, rethink how we develop our curriculum in this district and at our colleges, to think about how we engage in our hiring practices and how we evaluate how we evaluate our tenure track faculty, our adjunct faculty, our staff, and our administrators. All right, um, this type of work in the weeds is not, you know, it's not something that the board's really gonna be involved in, but at some point you're gonna see the end result. You're gonna see the new hiring procedures. You're gonna see the new evaluation procedures, right? Curriculum comes to you for board approval. Um, so as we start to engage in this work, right, we just need you all to be kind of vocal supporters of it, all right? And I'll just end on, there are lots of things within your sphere of influence that you have a lot of control over, including board policy. All right. Um, but I think uh, my, my colleague, Dr. Sims, is going to talk a lot more about your sphere of influence. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Sims. All right. So I want to talk to you all about the tool that I mentioned. Um, this tool is called the e Impact Equity Evaluation Grid. Um, I asked my son in the background, one of my many sons, I don't know if y'all know I have five sons and so they all want to start talking right now. Um, and so anyway, so the impact equity evaluation grid. So can we go to the next slide, please? Because after that conversation is heavy and it's purposefully heavy. This is serious stuff. We're talking about life and death. Um, not just physical life and death, right? But emotional life and death, or even life and death with regard to uh, careers or educational opportunities, right? We, we wield a lot of power in the institutions that we serve within. And so we always need to be mindful. We need to be cognizant of that. So I'm gonna leave this first slide up. Uh, and I wanna give you all maybe, maybe 15 seconds to just type the first two words. After you read the slide, just type two words in the chat on, on what this, the first two words that come up, I don't want anything that is, that is uh, composed, just whatever your visceral reaction is to this slide. Let me see it in the chat, please. And Jeremiah, you just might have to make sure you read them because the, uh, the public. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. So there's a picture here. Um, there's a, 
No, they can the, see the they can see the PowerPoint. The they won't be able, oh, okay. they won't be able to see the chat. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. All right. So whatever comes up, I'll probably just I'll hold on to it for right now. But for those of you all that want to that feel feel to share um, and can comfortably do so, please do that. So we have one. I'm not going to name names. It says you died. It's broken. And so just keep them coming. We can go to the next slide and I'll explain this next slide in, in, in just a second. Jeremy, can you go to the next slide? Yes, there you go, sorry. Thank you. So this is, this is my family. And the reason I put this slide here you don't have to comment on this slide, but uh, the reason I put this slide here is because there's oftentimes I lead conversations with this same activity and there'll be 20 or so pictures that come up. And more often than not, I find myself crying um, because I see that, that Trustee Goodman put pain. And, and, and for those of you who are invested in this work, those of you who are allies, you have to understand that there's an additional tactic to people of color uh, so I'm, I'm going to try to situate myself between self-aggrandizement and being disingenuous, right? So there's a, there's a happy middle that I want to kind of situate myself with this. So I am an expert on this, right? I went to school, I got a PhD, and my PhD is essentially in critical race theory and how it pertains to education. So because of my training, not only do I have colleagues inside of SMCCD and outside of SMCCD reached out to me, but I was sharing with... Uh, with our president Lopez earlier that I led a conversation with my family, my extended family around race. And so what happens in these conversations oftentimes is that people wanna show their solidarity and they wanna show that they too are hurting and are feeling something. But where it comes to me, they're also asking for it. Oftentimes surreptitiously and unbeknownst to them, they're asking for, for a debit. They want me to make them feel better about what they're feeling. And each and every time I'm asked to do that, there's a debit in my soul, right? And so I put this picture of my family up as the next slide so that I don't fall apart while I have this conversation with you. So can we go to the next slide, please? So what is the impact equity evaluation grid? So here's the thing. I know that you all wanna do something. Everybody wants to do something and I'm not trying to be dismissive. There are many things that people are doing. Here's another opportunity to employ a tool, right? So this tool, IMPACT stands for Innovative, Mindful, Purposeful, Actionable, Caring, and Transformative. And so this, this grid was created from an equity lens. So you do not need to have a full understanding of equity issues. Sorry, it's a really loud truck. You do not need to have a full understanding of equity issues in order to use this grid. You just have to be willing to reflect honestly on the policies, practices, and pedagogies present within your department and division, right? This extends to the board as well. This is individual work and it's collective work. This grid can be used by administration to begin addressing campus climate. So these numbers here uh, in parentheses correspond to the mandate from the state chancellor's office, the six points that they laid out. By looking at our policies and practices, it can be used by faculty to audit classroom climate. It can be used by the board to audit district climate and begin laying out action plans to create inclusive classroom, not only classrooms, but college campuses and an inclusive district. And it simplifies the path forward in that it easily exposes current inequities and provides a starting point for rapid change. And I'll explain more about that in the next slide. So this is the actual grid. Probably can't see it that well, but I'll share it for folks that are interested. Um, and so what the grid has, it has innovative. How does, so innovative has a very particular definition within this context. It's not innovative in that it's just new. It's innovative in that it addresses at a granular level, the anti-racist manifestations that we see, excuse me, the anti-black and other racist manifestations that we see in our policies, practices, pedagogies, and curricula. So it's innovative if it moves us away from that. It's mindful. So mindful, to be mindful means that we are always 
uh, cognizant of who is being positively impacted by a given policy, practice, or pedagogy, and who is being negatively impacted. I would offer to you all that there is no middle ground. There is no liminal space. All of our policies, practices, pedagogies, and even our curricula either privileges some or penalizes others. It's just the way it is. There's no neutrality. Education is inherently and intrinsically and intractably political. Is it purposeful? Is it clearly meeting the need and that it was created for it? I.e., does it positively impact poor ethno-racially minoritized students of color? Is it actionable? Is it well-resourced? Has it been communicated clearly? Can people get behind it? And does it have measurable results, right? Can we assess it? Is it caring? How will marginalized groups see that we care based on the way that we have not only audited, but also reimagined a given policy, practice, pedagogy, or curricula? And is it transformative? How is it working towards a more equitable campus culture? So next slide, please. And I'll go through this fairly quickly so that there are questions we can get to them. So can you all see what this is? This is pretty cool, right? I don't know if you all familiar with word cloud. So I took our mission statement and I just plugged it into a word cloud. I didn't do anything to it. So what do you guys see? Those of you that can see the image and I can share this. What's the biggest word there? It's district, right? So I would submit to you all brilliant folks that that's problematic. That if this is a representation, a pictographic representation of our mission statement and district is the largest word there, what I would take away from this is that most of the things that we do are in support of the institution. Because we're a student, students are there, students are fairly big, education is there, community is there, right? But the most prominent word there is district. So I think that that this is something that we need to reimagine. I think Jeremy alluded to this earlier, and I, I think you know it's probably time to take a look at our, our mission statement so that we can figure out whether or not, because I tried to plug the mission statement into the grid. Now, granted, the grid is, is, is created for policies, practices, and pedagogies, but we should be able to plug the, uh, the, the, the mission statement, sp statement into it. But what I found to be the case was that the mission statement was just too vague. It was full of really, really good uh, displays of heart, that our heart was in the right place, Right, if we go back to the grid, we don't have to go back to the slide, but there's three, three different designations on the grid. So where we wanna be is working in solidarity with our students to, to deconstruct anti-blackness and other forms of racism on our campus, right? So that's a heart, that's represented by a heart um, and a fist joined together. This is on the actual grid itself. Then the second one is just a heart. And so a lot of times our heart is in the right place, and we don't necessarily know what to do, right? And that's okay to a degree, but when you know better, then you must do better, right? And so what I'm encouraging us all is to figure out how to, how to know more, right? So that we can do better. And then the third, the third designation, and now so this grid was created before uh, I did the word cloud, but it is like a perfect kind of synchronicity between the two because the third kind of designation on the grid is the institution. Right, and so if the policy and the practice and the pedagogy only supports the institution, then it's quite possible and overwhelmingly likely that it is not serving the marginalized of the marginalized at the level that's necessary for them to reach their fullest potential. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So innovative, I talked about this. I can share this with everyone, so we don't have to go into this to any detail. Next slide, please. Oh, yeah, no worries. Mindful. Next slide, please. So we discussed this already. I don't want to spend too much time on it. Uh, we can just skip through these so that we can save time for questions. So purposeful, again, this is the, the acronym. So I just will say about this okay. call to action. I want to read. Oh, no, sorry. Can we go back to call to action, Jeremy? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, oh, yeah. Through your curveball. Yeah. So so is it actionable? So that's where the rubber hits the road. So we can get together because I know the board and, and, and my colleagues, I know a lot of you all well, and I know that you are brilliant folks. And I think we can get together and come up with some really great ideas, some paradigm shifting ideas. But where the rubber hits the road is whether or not we can actually do those things, right? And so I think that, that actionable is something that we have to key in on, right? Because also, you know, to keep in line with the chancellor's call to action, that word is really uh, resonating with me right now. So, so in the call to action, to determine whether or not something's actionable, actionable, we want to see if the planned activity or initiative must list what it takes to bring the, this activity to fruition, right? So that is, 
who we need to talk to to get the ball rolling, what the funding source is, if a funding source is necessary, who should be at the table, right? These are all things that are actionable because if we come up with brilliant ideas and we can't put them into play, uh, then it's almost more damaging, um, truth be told, because it, the way it comes off to students is that it's just lip service. Um, so can we go to the next slide, please? It has to demonstrate authentic care, right? That's something that Jennifer highlighted. Next slide, please. And it has to be transformative. So does this planned activity or initiative change the way that we look at, discuss, and seek to ed address longstanding instantiations of educational inequity? Does it change the educational career possibilities for the most marginalized students? Does it transform the educational atmosphere such that we as a campus community are closer to realizing educational equity for all students? Those should be our guiding questions, right? That work uh, um, in tandem with this grid in order to figure out whether or not, because a lot of the things that we do, and I can speak for myself primarily, but I think if y'all are being honest, um, you would admit the same thing. Some of the things that we do when we come to work, we do those things just because they've always been done that way. And it's more comfortable to do it that way because it is institutionalized, it's institutionalized practice. And I'm guilty of this just as much as anybody else. Some of these practices, I haven't questioned their genesis. I haven't questioned why I do the things that I do the way that I do. And we all need to do that. I'm encouraging all of us, encouraging all of us to do that if we actually wanna make some substantive change because this is a shift. And so I'll read this quote from Polo Freire, um, who is one of the foremost educational philosophers. Um, education does not change the world. Right? So we don't want to fetishize education or educational accomplishment. Education changes people. People change the world. And so the work that, that, that this grid is trying to do is metacognitive work. It's trying to get you to think about the way that you think about the work that you do in service of our students. Next slide, please. And so this I just took uh, because it was roughly the same length. So this is my personal educational philosophy that I wrote maybe eight years ago. Um, and so I want you to take a look at this, right? And I'm still figuring a lot of stuff out um, for sure. But this is from eight years ago or so. And you see critical, and, and, and my educational philosophy was, for whatever reason, almost as long as the mission statement would be clear. For those of you that know me well, that's not a surprise. Um, so critical, students, education, you see marginalized, it's social justice, mar marginalized, social justice, right? And so what I would offer is, we can scrap this. This is my own personal educational philosophy. What I wanted to give is provide a pictographic representation of what I think that we should be moving towards because students are actually in the center, not the district, right? Students are actually in the center of this pictographic representation. So if we claim to be student-centered, I think that that should be uh, readily transparent from our mission statement. Uh, next slide, please. And so here it is. This is a call to action. And after this, we can open it up for questions and for a discussion. There are no barriers to entry. You don't have to know what Jeremy knows. You don't have to know what Jennifer and Tabitha know in order to do this work, right? Lasana is a co-author on this. You don't have to be as conversant as Lasana is with this material. There are no barriers to entry. If you want to do this work, then the grid, while not perfect, is a tool that you can use to begin to deconstruct uh, kind of the way that you think about the work that you're doing so that at the end of that process, the work that you're doing matches your heart towards the marginalized of the marginalized, right? Because in order to do this work, it requires love, right? And that's one of Ferry's primary arguments. Not just love of students, that's awesome, but you got to love justice. You got to hold and cling to justice. This country at its best is founded on democracy and justice, right? And so we know that it has failed in many ways with regard to that, uh, uh, that work with uh, poor ethno-racially minoritized students of color. But that doesn't mean we have to follow that same tag. Um, at the same time, there's no middle ground. There is no, you can't sit on the fence. You got to get off the fence. You know, and I'm speaking to myself too. I'm excited. You have to, because I, I always talk about this, right? Because that's the same. You can ask somebody when there's someone ambivalent about something. Well, you know, I'm kind of on the fence about that, right? Which means I'm non-committal about that. But there's a fence that many of us object to that our president is trying to create. And if you're not opposed to the creation of the fence, if you're actually sitting on the fence, then you're fortifying the weight of the fence so that it works to continuously uh, dichotomize peoples, right? It, it has an in-group and an out-group. We got to get off the fence. Not only get off of it, but we got to tear it down. 
you don't have to have a priori knowledge, right? You don't have to have advanced degrees in critical race theory in order to do this work. Uh, this work is, is tailored for individual reflection, but it's better suited for collaboration because that's how we get things done. Mike has done a great job as president, as chancellor of, of, of catalyzing a spirit of collaboration. Uh, the board has done that as well, right? And so we need to keep we need to keep rocking with that, man. We need to we need to make sure that we are collaborating, not just to get stuff done, not just to check boxes, but we're collaborating so that our campus culture is a campus culture where students from any walk of life can come there and feel welcomed, valued, and affirmed. And this this tool, um, and along with whatever you receive from this conversation, should be used as a springboard to an action plan. And lastly, but certainly not least, I want to encourage you all: you can do this. It can be done. We can do this together. And so with that, I just want to thank you all. Uh, thank the board for the invitation to have this conversation. Um, and I, I really believe that at, at the College of San Mateo, I'm at the College of San Mateo, but at the College of San Mateo and at our district, we can do substantive work. And I think that we have the right people in place. Uh, as somebody would get offered this analogy, we have the right people on the bus. We just got to figure out how to make that bus do go exactly to the destination that we want, which is a campus culture that is predicated on anti-racism, um, educational equity, and justice for all the students we serve. And so with that, I can stop and we can open it up for questions. Thank you. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. <coughs> Chancellor, where are you? <laughs> um, should we start with the board members or did, Chancellor, did you want to add anything else? Uh, I don't I don't know I don't think there's anything that I can add um, I, I just I, I've had the privilege of working with everybody that presented tonight and I and, and at the level of a college president and, and the work that they do is truly transformative um, I, I've mentioned this in the past that I'm at a I'm at a point in my life in my career where I need to do a lot more listening because in order to lead, you need to listen. And so I, I wanna thank um, all of you tonight um, for just a great presentation. Uh, I mentioned this before that we wanna make anti-racism. I'd like to make anti-racism a theme for this ac coming academic year. And it's beyond just a statement, it's beyond you know just the, the year, it needs to be a theme for the district and for our colleges and, and for our students. And, and I think you've set a very good framework for us to, to really take action and make a difference. So thank you. I agree. Um, I just want to thank you all for being in this district and working together. Um, there just aren't enough words to describe how powerful we just what we just went through to hearing each each one of you speak. And I, I'm just really proud to know you and uh, to learn from you. So I open this up to other board members. I'm sure they're gonna have maybe, I don't know if they have any questions, but maybe some comments. Jade, there you go, our student trustee. Yeah, um, I just wanna say thank you to those that presented. Um, I do have a question though, um, because I know I saw Jeremiah students at CSM at a meeting like two or three weeks ago. I was wondering if any of y'all have had the chance to connect with the other associated students on the other two campuses. I know that Kenyatta and Skyline aren't having like summer meetings, but if y'all want, I can connect y'all with them. Because I think that this is such an important conversation to have with our student leaders, especially since they're usually the first point of contact for our students. And I think, especially right now with everything going on and our student leaders doing so much to connect with our students and making them feel supported, I think it's important to connect with them. And especially like from my experience on campus and in the classrooms when we talk about racism or anti-racism and equity we normally talk about or learn about the history of it we never really talk about what we can do today to make tomorrow better so i think this will be a really good conversation to have with our student leaders thank you Jen. Does thank you Jeremiah. An i see your comment that's great anybody have an answer for her about other student associations and the other colleges I guess not at the moment, but that. Well, that's, may, may I, I don't have a. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, Jeremiah. go ahead. Hey, Jeremiah. I, I don't have a. I don't have an answer, but I'm. I'm. I, I just need an invitation. 
Yeah. I'm not going to show up on it now. She give me an invitation and I'm there. Jamila will tell you the same. When I get invited, I show up. So uh, let me know, Jason, the invitation. I'd love to be part of the yeah, conversation. I can, I can share your contact information with the advisors. Mm -hmm. Same here, Jade. Really excited to work with students. We've had on uh, at Skyline, obviously, some town halls, some healing spaces um, in regards to just all the recent events. But it'd be great to bring this group to students as well. So totally in. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to say something, Jeremy. You something that struck me in your presentation was, I've always said we have these all this great stuff for our students, but they have to find it. Now I realize we have to find them, and I'm thinking of the same conversation. It's we're, we're expecting them to be sitting sitting there and, and understanding where to go. So uh, I think we we need to be we need to outreach more. Is 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 the directive? Uh, how we can do that together, I don't know. But question. I got I got to cite uh, Dr. Taylor Mendoza on that one, though. That was all her. <laughs> <laughs> Not surprised. Go ahead. Okay, uh, board members. Anybody else want to comment at this time? Uh, Maurice Goodman. Yeah, I just like to say uh, thank you to the presenters, Dr. Conaway, uh, Dr. Sims, Dr. Taylor Mendoza, Professor um, Wallace. Thank you all. Um, to you, Jeremy, uh, you know, thank you uh, specifically. Um, it's always good to, it doesn't always feel right at times when people call you out, but it's always good to get it done and have it, you know, have it done um, in such a way that it's intentional and, and direct. And I just like to commend you on being able to do that to us. And I hope, you know, that this board receives it, um, you know, you know, all too often, you know, when we ask for presentations, our faculty, our staff, even our students that sometimes they tiptoe on, on what to say and how to say it um, to the board. We, but we're here for you. And so I appreciate that. And, um, you know, you know, we have to own that. We, we missed an opportunity. We, we continually miss opportunities. Um, to do the work and to to have these conversations. Um, when we first started them, we did have critical conversations. We did um, have in-depth discussions. And um, at some point we began to um, either become complacent and begin to just make it ceremonial and be very um, passive. And so I, I appreciate the, 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 the calling out because we need that. And so I hope this board takes notice and we begin including our partners, our administration, um, you know, our chancellor um, understands that as we move forward, that we do uh, not lose sight of these opportunities that are afforded us to have these conversations and to be able to move the needle and not just um, cer have ceremonial conversations or uh, remarks about topics, but really dig deep on how we can truly um, take action on what we're learning today because it's about action. And so I guess that's what my question would be. Um, what do you see the next steps being um, with regards to um, moving uh, a lot of these initiatives forward, working with the chancellor's office, working with the board, um, ensuring that we are um, taking action and not just having the conversation now and then you know, between now and the next time it comes back up, that there is some some real needle movement on on these issues and, and evaluating as we go to ensure that we are becoming an anti-racist district. I mean, it goes beyond just a theme for a year, but really action should be the theme. Um, but how do we how do we evaluate it, and, and what are some of the next steps that you you foresee? So I, I can I can jump on this because with the with the tool that I described, there's a training that goes along with the tool. I feel like the tool is fairly straightforward, but I think that the tool, so I was thinking about how to create something that is a starting point for people who have disparate levels of knowledge with regard to how to enact anti-racist pedagogy and policy making. And so I, I think that next steps are to work with, work with the team so that we can figure out how to um, best kind of shape the training so that we can have conversations. So at CSM, um, you know, acting president, uh, I don't know what the, sorry, I'm just gonna say president, I don't know what the interim acting, I can't remember right now. I'm on vacation. So, uh, so we have, we have been running with, we have been running with the impact grid thus far um, at the College of San Mateo. 
And so President Lopez has been hugely supportive of that. And so, and so we feel like we already have uh, not mastered, we haven't mastered anything, but we're already headed in the right direction. So what's come out of that is that people want to work in kind of inquiry groups, use the grid to look at policies in their, in their specific spheres of influence, right? In their individual collective spheres of influence. And so I think that there should be some initial conversations about what that looks like. And, and it may be that the tool needs to be iterated on at some point, but right now I feel like it's a good starting point for people who are interested in doing this work. And so I guess to, to, to not ramble, but to answer the question more simply, uh, Trustee Goodman, I'm gonna develop, um, along with the team, I'm gonna develop a training so that folks can opt in to better understand how to use the tool. And then we should, we should convene some meetings. We should figure out, I know that's what everybody wants is more Zoom meetings, but we should figure out how to, how to have conversations because the point of the tool, right, is not only to introduce people to this important work, but also to give us a common language, right? So Jennifer spoke about this, Jeremy spoke about this, I believe Tabitha even alluded to this, right? If we have a shared language to talk about some of the issues that we're, that we're trying to tackle, I feel like at the very least, it, 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 it enables us to kind of disambiguate and, and even rid ourselves of misunderstanding. And so this, the, this really long answer is trying to say that there will be a training soon on how to use this particular grid in order to audit the policies that we currently have to see whether or not they are in fact anti-racist and if they're not, what, they need, what we need to do in order to make them fit with the direction of this district. Um, okay. And then I guess my second, the second part of that is like, how do we shift from the ready and willing versus I mean, and to the, to everyone? And you know, when you talk about the obligation, it should be all of our obligation. And so that, so how do we own that? And then how do, and where's the accountability piece? Um, and not just, okay, well, you know, we have a few that are, are willing and so we'll work with them while we can, but how do we transition it from the small few or hopefully it's, it's more, but from them to the whole, to the masses? <laughs> I was going to say, Trustee Goodman, I really feel that, you know, the board really sets the agenda, right? It mm -hmm. sets the goal, it sets the direction, and that's what the, um, the fellowship that you're a part of, right, is, is, is uh, getting presidents and trustees together to really begin to discuss and talk about how are we going to transform this institution? How are we going to transform the district? And so I think about the reason I mentioned the beautiful work that was done about, you know, with the strategic plan and social justice, when you, when the language got in there, that was, that was really exciting and, and, and the colleges were able to get on board. And so I agree with Jeremiah that obviously the assessment is very important and we have to go through our practices to see what's anti-racist and racist, but I also think the work of setting the agenda and revisiting where we're at and putting that framework there allows the chancellor then allows the you know the presidents and the vp to vps and so forth and so on and faculty to really begin to sort of integrate that have that same foundation and understanding to move the work forward so to me i think that's really important i understand you're you're speaking to how do we get other people on board but i think setting that agenda setting that direction is really really important um, so I just wanted to say that because I think we can get into the details and the weeds of it all, but I think your role, uh, you know, the board's role is it's just extremely essential to, to the work. So I don't know if I answered your question. Um, I think so. I mean, I, I look at it like, you know, a tool when, yeah. it, when we're saying, hey, we're introducing this tool. Um, for me, I look at tools. I purchased a paint machine and tried to spray my whole house as I was painting, but ended up getting back to what I was used to. And that was a paintbrush because I, the paint went all over the place. And yeah. so um, I needed, I need to be trained on how to use that tool. So use, having this tool available to us, um, my concern is that we don't become complacent and not just the board saying this is what we want to do, but having it be within the DNA of our district that this is who we are and um, it's not going to be just those top level skilled individuals that take this on uh, voluntarily, 
But those that may not take it on voluntary for whatever reason, whether it's um, that they're unaware, that they have their own insecurities about addressing um, racial inequities, um, but we're going to take everyone and meet them where they are. And what's the universal response as a district? Um, I guess not just from the board saying, hey, this is important to us, but as an administration, how do we take that? from the high level of the board setting that vision as this is where we want to be in a few years. Um, but where do we, how do we, how does that translate to um, an adjunct professor, uh, a classified employee? How does, that's all I was asking. Yeah, no, sure. and actually, sure. I was just going to say real quick, just to respond to Trustee Goodman. You're right, uh, Trustee Goodman, it, it is so important. I feel like the tool that Jeremiah has is for the colleges. And I feel like once that the vision, the you know, is set, the word, the language definition is the college's is responsible to do the work to get everyone there. So that's what I was trying to contextualize okay. a little bit. But I think we're we're on the same page okay. um, with that. So I appreciate that. Thank you. And I just wanted to offer uh, another point, uh, Trustee Goodman, for everyone who's on this call. So here's the thing that that I that Trustee Goodman is speaking to. I know I know I know what he's speaking to because he's said it, and I've also experienced this, that there are things that will happen and they negatively impact poor ethno-racially minoritized students of color. And then when the conversations arise, people will just are able to feign ignorance or maybe they're genuinely ignorant. And they didn't know that these negative repercussions would happen, even though they've happened time and time again, the research bears this out, right? So I can assure you that if we go through this tool the way that it was designed, this is my promise to you, Trustee Goodman, and to the rest of the board, that people will no longer be able to feign ignorance. If they make a decision and that decision negatively impacts poor ethno-racially minoritized students of color, then they did so knowingly, right? And so what that opens up is a different set of conversations. Because when you can fake ignorance, right, that becomes a kind of insulation and a protection. But the design of this tool is to take away the ability for people to feign ignorance so that they have to answer for, right? And we're not, I'm not talking about some call out, cancel culture. I'm not trying to get into all that. But what I'm saying is that if someone makes a decision and it negatively impacts poor Latinx students, then they did so knowingly because we're taking away the ambiguity. And so I think that that's why I'm a proponent of this tool, right? And so, and so again, the tool is not perfect. This is the first pass because it, I was trying to create something that everyone can engage in, irrespective of where they are uh, with regard to their understanding of anti-racist uh, anti -racist paradigm. But I really think that if we can use it correctly, and it's gonna take all of us to figure out what correctly looks like, if we can use it correctly, people, again, will not be able to say, well, I didn't really know it was gonna work out like that, because we told you. After we looked at the policy, after we looked at the practice, after we looked at the curricula, we filled out this rubric, we filled out the grid, we turned it in, we had a conversation about it, you still opted to do this thing, well, now we need to talk about why you did that, because you knew full well, we already identified who was gonna be negatively impacted from it. And so I just wanna make sure that, to express that that is the ultimate goal of, of, of this grid. Thank you. Trustee Norris. Okay. Yeah, well, uh, let me also thank everyone first for the presentation. And um, if Maurice says that, you know, he goes from a, a machine to a brush, I go from brush to an actual painter because I make such a mess. I got to have professionals. <laughs> There's things I do not know. And I know that there are things I don't know. Uh, but one thing I do know, and I think that all of my colleagues on this board are of the same mind is that we do not want to be people that are doing things that are, are hurtful to other people or not doing the right things to advance all people and all of our students. I just just didn't see it all and I, I'm ready to be challenged uh, because I, I would like to do the right thing and I think we all would. And so that's why the tool is important and your input, all of you, to work with us and help us how to use it, help us how to see it and help us how to understand it. I bought this book, and maybe it looks familiar to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have it, I've read it. Uh, not the whole thing yet, I'm working, I just came yesterday. But I, I, I've, I've seen the, the first three webinars I've missed today, sorry Jeremy, I will pick you up. I, I am pledged to learn and do what I can and to see that we can move this board in the correct direction. We just need to be uh, helped pointed in the right direction and, and I and I think that that's what would be the most valuable help to me as an individual. 
Trustee Mendelker. Yes, thank you. Uh, first, uh, excellent, terrific presentation, and you know, Dr. Conway and Dr. Sims, Dr. Taylor Mendoza, and Dr. Wallace. I mean, having had the opportunity to work individually and know each of you individually, I know how special you are and and how brilliant you are, frankly, in in, in these topics and communicating it. But together as a team, you're really incredible. So I mean, this this group effort is really spectacular, and I want to go download the book now on my Kindle and read it now and, and get more of the backstory on this. I think your impact model is brilliant because it's simple enough to understand, but very powerful, it's very elegant. And I think that that's a real testament to the work that you put into this, that you come up with something that's powerful, but easy to understand. It can actually be used by people who are not experts, who don't have a PhD in this. And that's very important because I think, you know, I agree with a lot of things. I just want to touch on a few of the comments that you all have made in your presentation. One of the things I've learned as a trustee is change is really hard in this institution, in, in any institution. It's just sort of not in the basic nature of human beings, I think, to want to change easily. And yet we are capable of change, even though we have a hundred year culture here that we're, we're working against in a lot of cases, but we're working to make changes. And I'll just give one example where I think when we work together on this stuff, we can make very positive changes. And that was around the issue of the prerequisite testing that we did, which was clearly a system that was biased and that did a disservice, especially to our students of color. And when we got rid of those uh, you know, entry testing and the re concept of remedial courses, and I think we were way in front of where the state was on doing this thing, that was a good thing for our institution. It was a good thing for our students. It was a good thing for you know, breaking down some of the racist barriers in this institution. I think that was a real win for our community together to work on that. So I think there is hope that we can do these things when we work together. I will say, is something I can't remember if it was you, Dr. Simpson said this or Dr. Wallace that said this, but you know, we tend to talk a lot and not necessarily take action. And that's something I would like to see change that we move more towards actionable items and not just talk about these issues, but actually take on some challenges. And I think the one that you pointed out for a district that talks a lot about students first and that we put the students at the center of what we do, when you look at our mission statement, and I thought the word cloud was really powerful, when students is not what's at the center of that word cloud, and it absolutely should be, and that should be a real wake up call that we have work to do on that mission statement. And we need to go back and work on that until it looks more like Dr. Sims, like your personal mission statement on educational philosophy where you have students right in the middle of it. That's the, where we should be aiming. And that's what we should be working on together. And I think that's maybe an actionable step that we can take as a board together, which will hopefully send the right message going forward. So I think there, there's a lot of work to do and I think we have to move beyond the talk. And I think Trustee Goodman is right, is when we started these conversations several years ago, we, we had a lot more critical conversations, and I think you're absolutely right, Professor Wallace, when you know, we backslid on that and to a point where a lot of these are now just the celebratory of, oh, it's Black History Month, so let's all talk about what great things we do in Black History, or it's LGBTQ Pride Month. It's like, yeah, that's nice, but let's really do something that makes a difference, and let's make some change. And I just want to close with referring back to our former president of Skyline College, uh, President Stanback Stroud, where she told me one thing at one point, which I think is also a very powerful message, which I think gets into why sometimes we're afraid to take the action and step into this and make the change, especially for those of us who may be well-meaning but are not experts in this area, which is, it's okay not to be perfect. I'm paraphrasing what she said, that you know, as long as you have sort of good intentions or willing to wade into this with an open mind and an open heart and engage in the discussion, we don't need to be perfect in this issue. We can all go in and make mistakes and still make good forward progress together. So I think that's important to note that you know, some of you are experts, which is great. And I'm glad we have you there to help lead your team. A lot of us are not, but I think we all have good intentions and we want to get there together as a district. Thank you. Trustee Halliburton. So uh, again, uh, I thank everybody. It's been very, uh, um, flood provoking uh, presentation. And uh, I think Dr. Sims began to um, uh, put it into the concrete terms because that's kind of what I look for uh, in your, in your you know, uh, re response to uh, Trustee Goodman. Um, uh, you know, um, I agree also with uh, a couple of comments other trustees made that um, this standing item on our agenda, contemporary conversations and race, class and gender, which was added by a, a board president a couple of years ago. To me, most of what goes on under that topic 
or reports that are no really no different than reports we've traditionally gotten um, where we learn about activities that are all you know good, worthy, and gives us the opportunity to pat ourselves on the back and say, you know, God bless us each and every one, because aren't we wonderful? Um, so um, it, in some ways, it I don't know, it, it to me is a misuse of uh, having that as a standing item uh, for a catch-all, you know, for, for every celebration we do. Um, I guess I, I would say since, you know, um, I've been professionally, been about um, trying to build a movement to make fundamental change uh, in the power structure. Uh, that's why I joined the labor movement when I was quite young uh, and have been trying to figure out for, you know, many, many years, you know, how you do it and how you really take on um, the power structure and make real change that matters. I would say, you know, I disagree with some of the remarks that uh, I do think we're at a moment uh, where, yeah, because of police killings that were captured on cameras, uh, on phones, um, there's something happening, but it's happening because, you know, the, people took to the streets in, 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 in numbers that um, you have to go back decades to think of the, the the kind of disruption, the spontaneous disruption, uh, you know, mostly peaceful, but sometimes not, that is the only thing that shocks the establishment into realizing the price of doing nothing is higher than the price of doing something. And what I worry about is, is it gonna be accommodation where, you know, this conversation is going on in every business in America, every, corporation is doing their, we got to, you know, we got to be part of the solution around the oppression of African Americans. That's happening, right? But a lot of that can end up, well, we'll write a check. I don't know, I'm talking about corporate responses, um, you know, um, and we'll be sincere, but does it change anything? So I'm looking for what changes things, what produces results. And, um, I don't know if this is completely off topic, um, but when you talk about curriculum, you know, is there room in our curriculum for us to be training people to go out and be street organizers for change? Because I, I kind of think that's going full circle. Uh, part of what you got to do if you're trying to empower oppressed people, um, it, it requires a lot of skills, a lot of organizational skills communication skills, movement building skills. I would love to have a curriculum in that. And people can actually, they're not going to make a fortune, but there are jobs out there doing it. I don't know if that's totally off the wall, but uh, I'll throw that out as my, as my suggestion. Uh, maybe something that we can think about doing. Is that crazy? I don't know. I went to, you know, I, I, I went to a, a program to learn how to be a labor organizer. And, you know, there are a few people that did and got me started. So maybe we need to do that, train people to be street organizers for you know social change for the oppressed. Interesting, Jeremy. I was just, yeah, like I totally agree, um, Trustee Holliber. Um, you know, like I, I I think that one of the things that we need to look into is having ethnic studies programs and social justice programs across the district, not just at CSM. Um, but I think that type of transformative curriculum needs to be across the entire campus, right? Um, we, can't, we can't relegate that type of learning to a certain department or certain program. And so I would, I would like to engage the board, the administration, my faculty colleagues in developing a curriculum that's going to be transformative no matter what class they take, right? And I think Jeremiah is more of an expert on this because he Jeremiah is really one that kind of coined the term critical reality pedagogy, which is all about making sure that the students <clears throat> bring their lives into the classroom and that they're able to take what they learn in this classroom and change, um, change the communities that they, that they live in to um, change their life prospects, 
et cetera. So I mean, I'll let Jeremiah speak to that, but I would, I think, I think we have a really cool opportunity here to like really transform the entire curriculum. Well, can I just respond by saying, I'm not saying it's an either or I'm, I'm right. a, I, I agree. I'm just saying maybe that's something that, you know, we can think about too. Totally. Yeah. To both. I'm just, I just wanted to like expand on that. So I, yeah, totally. Yeah. And I, I agree wholeheartedly. So just to give some brief context, um, Critical pedagogy holds that education is intrinsically and inherently political and as such is inherently and intrinsically oppressive. Um, reality pedagogy, which was so critical pedagogy comes from Freire and Freire and disciples like Jerome, McLaren, Ira Shore, people of that ilk. Reality pedagogy comes from Christopher Emden. Reality pedagogy was something that he used to talk about. Uh, it was like a kind of contemporization of multicultural education. So I felt like there, there needed to be a kind of a, a extension of both of those, um, in my humble opinion. And so that's what birthed critical reality pedagogy is in my first book. My first book is called uh, Revolutionary STEM Education, Critical Reality Pedagogy and Social Justice in STEM for Black Males. So in that book, I define critical reality pedagogy. Critical reality pedagogy, the easiest way to do it is to take a look at the uh, metaphor for thinking, critical thinking, right? Which is to think outside the box, except critical reality pedagogy, not only equips, empowers, and encourages students to think outside of the box. It encourages them to turn around, look at the box's positionality, and figure out who is being negatively impacted and who be, who's being positively impacted by the boxes or the paradigm's positionality so that they can then figure out whether or not they need to deconstruct the box wholesale or whether or not it can be uh, re remanufactured so that it's commensurate with social justice. And so that's what critical reality pedagogy does. It's basically teaching for, teaching for liberation. And so just to give some context, I agree, Trustee Holliburn, I agree with, with uh, Professor Wallace. I think that, that, and this is something, this may be longitudinal, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's something we figure out fairly quickly. So when I was a, a lecturer at UC Berkeley, I taught a course that was in education, but it was an American cultures course. Every department, every division has an American cultures course. American cultures courses talk about asymmetrical power relationships around race, around gender, around orientation, around uh, any number of things. And so I think that it would be awesome if there was an AC kind of, I'm just using that generic terminology, AC kind of course um, offered in each discipline. So irrespective of what you want to do, you've taken a course that talks about human differentiation. And so I'm, I'm all on board with that and would love to think th with folks, uh, think through that with folks who are interested in doing that, provided our district is ready to head in that direction. And I just want to jump in. I I definitely agree with Trustee Holliber. Um, I think we also need to, in, in addition to focusing on curriculum, we need to help empower our students to have these conversations. When we talk about student senate, when we talk about student organizations and clubs, how are we helping them to empower themselves? How are we helping them use their strengths and highlight their voices and help them um, create this change instead of listening to them and sometimes trying to placate them or um, trying to silence them, right? How are we truly empowering our students to use their strengths and use what they bring with them to begin these organizational shifts and grassroots movements um, and struggle for liberation in a way that um, truly brings them into the conversation at every level? Trustee Metalkern. Yes, thank you. And I would say, so Dr. Sims, you know, there you go again. You've got me another book that I need to read now, your, your book on STEM education. That's a subject that's near and dear to my heart. And as I want to say, in a, I'm in agreement with uh, Dr. Wallace, Professor Wallace, because I think you're absolutely right. This is something that we have to include in every curriculum. It's not just a separate curriculum for those that are interested. It's something that has to permeate everything we do. And I'll just cite the example that I gave a few years ago, and I'm sorry if I'm going to bore people and repeat this, but when I look at one of the examples of tech, sort of technology-enabled institutional racism, which is facial recognition software, and you, you look at the, the you know, huge negative impact of that, and then you sort of ask yourself, or at least I ask myself, I think is a fairly obvious question, which is if we had more software developers of color working at companies like Facebook and Amazon and Google, building the software, would we be having quite that same impact in terms of how that, the negative impacts of how that technology is being used? And I think the answer is pretty clearly no, it, it would not be the case. And that's why 
I think it's very important to include this in all of our curricula. So those students that are STEM majors, for example, they're, they're not immune to this. They're not separated from this. They're getting the same lessons as well and learning these same things as well, because I think it's critically important for all of our students to get this exposure and to get this experience while they're here at our institution. Uh, Vice President Norris. Yes, um, you know, I, I, I understand all of that. And uh, I'm hearing, obviously, that we need to work within our institution to make sure that we are not teaching and we're not providing a curriculum and we're not providing a, a campus and a culture which perpetuates these types of behaviors that disadvantages people of color particularly to move forward. But there's a lot of other people on that campus that are not people of color and I don't know how you're going to get somebody necessarily at 18 or 20 or 30 that comes on the campus and has a whole, a whole life, basically, of experiences and has their mindset already set. That's why when we had a discussion a couple of nights ago, we were talking about this needs to go back into the high schools. It needs to go into the elementary schools. It has to start at kindergarten where, where, where children are, are still fresh and new. And, and you start teaching them uh, how they're supposed to behave as human beings and respect each other and their classmates. Um, it, it's, it's just, uh, you know, uh, at this age, dealing with the other people in the school uh, is going to be a lot harder. And I think that's a, that's a huge challenge that we're going to have to be faced with as well if we're going to make any kind of real progress. I want to just uh, speak to that a little bit. I understand. I understand that, that that does represent some challenges, but I can guarantee you, trustee nurse, that you learned some things in school that you didn't really care that much about. You learned them because you had to learn them because they were required in order for you to advance in your educational trajectory, right? I think that's true of all of us. I didn't really care. I have my undergraduate degrees in rhetoric. I wasn't that interested in, in ancient Grecian culture, but I had to take the course in order to fulfill the, the, the requirements for my degree, right? And I learned it. So even if it's at that level, it still helps to have people have those conversations because we don't know and we can't predict who is going to be moved and whose attitudes um, and idiosyncratic worldviews will be changed as a result of experiencing uh, coursework that speaks to human differentiation and speaks to differences um, differences in 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 kind of folkways and mores and 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 social. Uh, political and social historical understanding, and so I understand that it's a challenge, but it's not a it's not a zero sum game. When we do work that positively impacts poor ethno racially minoritized students of color, that means that we are doing good, valuable work. We are doing efficient, effective, efficacious pedagogy, and that benefits all students, not just those students. No, I agree with you as far as that goes. I, I'm not suggesting that we would not want to do that as well and expose everyone as much as we can. But we can't, just, we can't just look at ourselves in a vacuum because we inherit students. So maybe we can get to the root cause as well and work with, collaboratively with the other uh, educational institutions that basically deal with students before us. So then we don't have to have the laboring or and try and change people's mindsets. It's got to start from younger. We have to collaborate with all educational institutions within our community here. I mean, I don't know that we can do the whole world, but we can definitely bite off our piece here, you know, and, and make some change around what we're doing here. Yeah, this, this will probably uh, get, get me impeached from my uh, district Senate presidency, but you know, mate, why don't we, why don't we re-envision the dual enrollment curriculum? I agree, yeah. I, I think a lot of it is understanding that we can't take the responsibility to teach our students about how to deconstruct systems of oppression and racism outside of our, our district without acknowledging that our district is a system of racist and, and uh, systematic oppression. So we have to understand that and do them both at the same time. That's well said, I agree. Any other comments before we address your Yeah, I'd just say again to the point of does this need to be embedded in, in all of our curriculum? And again, I'll argue strongly yes, it does. 
Um, there's like Dr. Sims, you said, you know, you got a rhetoric degree and maybe some of these classes on, you know, ancient Greek philosophers may not have been why you were doing this, but it's, it's been valuable. And I think the same thing is true. And I, I think to, you know, a current example of Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg, which is if he had completed his undergraduate education, maybe had taken some classes in uh, ethics and morality and in philosophy and, you know, things like that, that maybe we'd have a little bit different world now because he would have been exposed to a few things that would have helped change the outcome of, of where we've gone with this, with this social media thing. So I, I think there's value in exposure. Even, even if it doesn't seem particularly relevant at the time, I think it's part of the process of creating educated people, which is what we're trying to do with this, is, is people learn how to think, they learn how to learn, and that's a skill that they take with them for their entire life. Great. Any other comments before we... Very, very wonderful dialogue. Um, things that go through my head that we, we talk, you talked briefly about as a board, can we review our mission statement? Can we look at it? Can we maybe decide that there's some things that we need to change? Um, is it, it, we can do policy, that's what we can do. But I think uh, with the help of, of the learned people within our district, let's take advantage of that. <laughs> you can help us, um, Jeremiah, to get, get us through that, to really look at what, what, what is the district all about and, and what, what is the policy of this board. Um, and I think there, then it becomes, it is the way it is. And we accept the way we are. I can't remember if I read, it was only one district, but I was happy to see that a high school district is now doing ethnic studies. And again, if they're, I think it's Jefferson High School District is putting it in, if I remember correctly. If they're gonna do that, and then we have our ethnic studies here, we can work, you know, there's, there's a connection right there with some young people, so, uh, and promote maybe that, how successful that's going to be that, uh, down to other districts. So I think there's a lot of work that we can do. And, but we can't do it unless all of our learner people help us here to, to guide us in the right direction. And I think, Jeremiah, you've got some wonderful ways to, get, to guide us there. Anything else you'd like to comment on before we move on? Great conversation. I'm going to... Well, before we move on, maybe uh, I hate to ask you this, but um, Dr. McVean, I know answered some questions about international students, and I don't know if Chancellor, if you want to touch on that for a few moments. So we have questions in our chat. A question, I guess it was a question and answers about the inter what we've read about international students in the paper. Um, sure, uh, Dr. McVean, do you want to? Do you want to? I know you shared. Uh, information with individuals, but maybe you can summarize where we're at, what we're doing as a district. Uh, sure. Uh, thank you, Chancellor Clare, uh, President Swartz, members of the board. Um, so, you know, it's been a rough year. Um, when we started this academic year back in the fall, um, we've, we've suffered attacks on our, our DACA students, our undocumented student population. And this COVID environment has really highlighted disparities um, and, and students of color and low income students have suffered. And this is uh, another one in a, another uh, unexpected turn from our federal government. And so um, what I wanna share with you is that as soon as we learned of this, um, we have taken immediate action to uh, assemble our international student program leaders from across the district. We have analyzed what the order says. Um, we are exploring all of the legal options that we will have in order to support our, our uh, international students. Uh, we believe have uh, ways forward. Um, we're not the only institution that has uh, developed ideas about how to support our international students in this moment. Um, and uh, Lawsuits have already been filed to uh, stop this order from moving forward. But regardless, I think that we have uh, solutions that have been put on the table. Um, and, and as soon as we finalize those, we'll be sharing those with the board um, for our direction forward. But uh, I want to assure everyone that um, we are taking this very seriously. And we see this as yet another uh, opportunity to demonstrate through our actions, not just our words, our commitment to social justice as a district, because 
um, this this policy, uh, like so many others that have been handed down, is um, a racist attack against a specific group. And so um, uh, I wanted to, to make sure that uh, you know that we're, we're doing everything that we can and we are committed to um, having a solution for students um, to continue their education with us, whether they remain here in the US or uh, return to their home countries. Um, and that situation is going to evolve. It's probably going to evolve rapidly. And so we'll make sure to, to continue to update the board on that. Um, at the most basic, there's three options as an institution. We're either 100% online, 100% face-to-face, or a hybrid institution. And in the fall, we will be a hybrid institution. That means some very specific things under the current order that was released. But at its most fundamental, it means that um, international students who are in the U.S. to maintain their F-1 visa status will have to have some amount of in-person instruction. Uh, a number of those students will be enrolled in some of the essential um, areas that we've already identified. Uh, and for those that are not already enrolled in those uh, essential infrastructure courses, um, we'll be actively putting solutions in place. Uh, but as we, we develop those, we'll make sure to communicate that, those to the board, to the chancellor, to everyone throughout the district and to the students that are gonna be impacted. So. Um, it's been a lot of activity already, and you can expect that to continue. Uh, thank you, Dr. McVean, and I appreciate the fact that you handled those on your own and plus gave us a synopsis of where we are at this point, and we'll continue, I'm sure, to hear more as we go along. Uh, Trustee Mandelkern? Yeah, I wanted to address that because, uh, uh, Dr. McVean, you were proceeding right down the line of where I was going to comment uh, during our board member comments, so I'll go ahead and make it now which is having read through you know, the proposed orders. And, and first of all, let me preface by saying, I think this is an absolutely horrible, and I can't, I don't wanna use four letter words to describe it right now, which is how I would normally describe what was, what's being proposed. It's, it's completely unfair and, and prejudicial against our international students. And I'm wholeheartedly in favor of doing whatever we can to, to stop this from impacting our students. And having read the proposed actions, I think you're right in line with what my thinking was, is if, if we can establish the fact that as, as, as you know, our three colleges are executing the hybrid option right now, where we do have some hands-on essential learning classes and some online, so we're not 100% online. So if we establish that as the baseline, and my understanding is that the students only have to be enrolled in one in-person course to be able to stay in this country and continue to take their online courses, it's different if we're not a hybrid, if we're online only, they don't get to take online courses at all. It doesn't, doesn't work, is my understanding. So, so we have to be hybrid. Then we have to have one in-person class that they can sign up for, and you're correct, some will be in the essential course that we'll be offering. But I'm wondering, following on our conversations we had about SMAC and the student access at our last board meeting, is can we sort of coordinate one in person, uh, you know, have some kind of CAD class that uses the SMAC facility, for example, where students are going to be coming on campus already to do that, where we can enroll some of our international students in, in that to give them that one face to face class that will enable them to stay here in the country. Is there, you know, can we, can we be clever in that regard in terms of creating the right environment to support and protect our international students? Yeah, and those are exactly the type of options we're exploring. What, what would fit into a, a student's degree program and have um, the least uh, potential negative impact on their ability to enroll but still fulfill um, that order? Um, that's exactly the lines that we're thinking. We have some other options on the table as well, um, and so that's what we're working through. Thank you, yeah. Chancellor. And I'll, I'm going to um, credit Aaron, actually, with this insight, uh, we're still trying to work with County Health uh, regarding what we can and can't do. And and Aaron, and maybe Aaron, it was from somebody else, but you made the observation that yes, we can offer essential, um, you know, we can offer courses face to face in essential areas. But what about those prerequisite courses that lead to, you know, think of nursing and all the prerequisites? So we're going to be exploring that with County Health, and I think that'll also. Um, help with a number of students, um, not just our international students in those areas. So that was a, that was a really good insight and we're gonna pursue that. And I'm sorry, I I, um, I saw um, the student trustee. Um, Jade would like to comment. Yeah, I'm sorry to step on you there, Jade, but I'll stop. Hey, no, Jade, that's fine. Um, thank you. I just wanted to say that um, a lot of the international students have reached out to me, uh, asking me 
what the board is going to do in regards to the situation. I think what their biggest fear is for most students is that if they do have to leave the U.S., it's going to be harder for them to come back. Because for students like me from where I'm from, I'm from the Bahamas, so it's easier for me to travel back and forth because luckily my visa is five years. But I know so many students who they, they're only issued a visa for six months. And once their visa expires, it's going to be harder for them to leave their country to come back for face-to-face -face classes. So I think that that was their biggest concern. And when they transfer, it's going to be even harder to like change that whole visa. And so they wanted to know, is there a way that they can stay in the country? And I think a lot of them were talking about finding a class that they can take in person if it's only one day a week. And so I think this would be good for them to hear. I have the associated students asking me, is there going to be a public statement anytime soon that they can release to their social media so a lot more students know? The answer to the question, they'll be, as soon as we know, they'll know, right? Uh, Dr. McGreen, I'm sure. Yeah. Thank you, Jade. Anybody else on this topic? It's not really a topic. I was just going to say that we should kind of, you know, proceed cautiously as we you know turn this into an actual item that was not on the agenda so right. kind of teetering on the brown act there's some q and a that's yeah. come up on the, top Under the question well. yeah question yeah. and answers on the agenda okay so shall i appreciate all of that should we move to communications does anybody have one that i don't know about <laughs> i don't see anything now we're down to statements from board members. Any board members want to make any additional comments? Uh, Trustee Mendelkern? Yeah, I just wanted to comment on, as for the last week, for the first time in about three and a half or almost four months now, I was actually able to go to some in-person activities uh, on related to our colleges, which was great to be able to get out and socially distant and properly masked and I apologize if I didn't recognize everybody behind their masks and goggles, these things. But the first was uh, last Friday at the uh, tour of uh, Kenyatta Building One, uh, which and seeing the progress that's being made there, and I think being very responsive to some of the concerns that were raised from last fall onwards with that. And it appeared to me, and I'm sure we'll, we'll hear if this is not the case, we'll hear from the, the CAD uh, faculty and staff at Kenyatta on this, but I believe we are making progress in addressing the concerns and making sure this building first and foremost meets the needs of our students uh, for athletics, kinesiology, dance, and the rest of the programs there. Um, so uh, congratulations to the team there working together to really uh, make, make, I think, very positive change and positive strides forward with that building. And then the second was the uh, uh, TIP graduation, uh, which is a, a fabulous program for those that don't know, the Trade Introductions Program, which is a pre-apprenticeship training program for uh, men and women who are interested in uh, pursuing a, a career in the building and construction trades uh, and becoming an apprentice uh, for a union job in there. And so this was the, I can't even keep track now of, of which of how many of these we've done now. And, and so, you know, a multi-month training process and the students give up, I believe it's their Tuesday nights and their Friday nights. And for a bunch of young people to give up their Friday nights means they're really serious about this program doing it. And again, a lot of uh, kudos for the creativity it was actually a drive through or drive up graduation where the students and their family stayed in their car in the parking lot. Uh, there was, you know, a tent and a platform set up to uh, read off the names and, and give them their certificates. So it was, it was very nicely done. And, and frankly, one of the few celebrations I've actually seen uh, this semester for our students who deserve so much credit for everything they've been able to accomplish on top of everything they've had to deal with and persevere through and, and make it through this, this crazy time this semester. So it was very nice to see that that tip graduation ceremony take place. They had everything, but they were not able to serve the traditional cake. So I'm really, <laughs> I was personally disappointed there was no cake, but I'm sure I'll manage to get over my disappointment. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments from board members? Yes. Trustee Holliver? Uh, sure. So I'll return to a comment I made at the last uh, board meeting and would ask to have this agendized. Um, and that is with the election coming up, um, I think we need a clear uh, board policy that would prohibit um, the donation, uh, direct contributions, uh, as well as solicitation uh, of contractors, uh, vendors uh, by um, um, 
probably form 700 uh, administration reporters uh, to, to just create a very clear rule on that. So um, I would like us to have that policy adopted. So I guess the first step would be to agendize it. I think we can agendize the discussion. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. We'll do that. Anything else? Uh, Trustee Goodman? Yeah, I just want to um, guess discuss uh, another missed opportunity um, as we're, you know, we, it was brought up earlier that, you know, our discussions, um, I look at them as missed opportunities. Um, in the past, um, our board showed distinct leadership in providing words and actions by showing our commitment to our DACA students and providing a safe environment for all of our students. I can't hear you. We are confronted with additional life oh hello can you hear yes. me now i can hear you okay. yeah i can hear you definitely. okay said in the past few months we were confronted with additional life altering civil unrest and politically motivated racist policies that is impacting our students in the ways of the situation with our international students um unlike our past actions we've been silent um this board has spoken out we've um our faculty our staff um in these last few months whether it's the um assessed, the discussion around the death of uh, floyd um and now recently um the response to our students and their concerns and rightful concerns uh, around what to do. Are they going to lose their ability to stay in this country? Um, I do, do believe it's a missed opportunity for this board to send out some form of official communication to our educational community with the response, not from our administration. I'm speaking to my colleagues on this board um, that we um, send out some communication um, the, uh, the missed opportunity around um, the Floyd situation and the additional civil unrest that uh, pursued regarding Black Lives Matter. Not that it was understandable, but I'd rather be out there marching. I'd rather be out there showing action, um, standing arm in arm with our students that have been organizing and protesting up and down our county. That's great. Um, but now here we are um, yet again, um, and this is an opportunity. We can either look at it as a missed opportunity or we can really get on it and, and take, some op take some time, um, either write a letter from our hearts um, or coordinate the communication with someone to make sure that we send out a message to, to ensure that our students aren't waiting. And if they're uh, uh, unafraid, if they're afraid or if they are unsophisticated to be able to click on and say, hey, I have something to say, but they get in the chat and they ask the same question. It's in our chat, you can look at the Q&A, that they're asking questions, they have concerns, and I'm sure they're real concerns and they have real fear about how this will impact them. And they need to hear from us as, our, as a leadership. Um, and I hope that we take this as an opportunity and, and don't miss it. I, I agree. I'd like to see if we could do something similar to what we did uh, for our DACA students back in 2016 and have maybe direct the board president to bring back a statement that we can review and approve at our next board meeting. Yeah, I'm fine with that. I think that's a good idea. Um, Chancellor, we can uh, have put something together for the next board meeting. Um, maybe we'll have more in direct information by then, but uh, instead of just the hearsay this happened so soon, but be happy to do that, absolutely. Okay, anything else? Um, the only thing I have is I was happy to attend also, but I'm sorry, it wasn't in person, it was by Zoom. Uh, the EOPS, end of the year celebration from the Kenyatta College EOPS people, and it's very uplifting to be in the same chat with uh, 
on the same screen with the, these students who have worked so hard to uh, normal times, let alone these unnormal times, and they pursue and they completed, and it was a wonderful afternoon of celebration. So we, uh, through it all, there sometimes is a bright light and uh, they, keep, they keep moving and give us inspiration as they go forward. Hearing nothing else, I think we are at the end of the agenda. Um, the board will have a regular meeting via Zoom. Our next regular meeting will be July 22nd. So if there's no further business, I will adjourn the meeting and you're all free to leave. Bye.